Hey, you guys, and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. This week, I have a special guest, and we are going to be diving in to talking about herbs to treat and prevent common chicken diseases. You know that moment when you walk out to the chicken coop and you see that hen and you know, just you know that something's not right. Oh, what do you do at that moment? If you're like me, I have all the books of like trying to identify what's wrong with your chickens and what to do about it. But sometimes even then we don't feel real confident about it. So whether it is bumblefoot and something you can cure really easily at home or all the way the full spectrum, all the way to avian influenza, we're going to be talking today with Heather Levin who is a good friend of mine. She's actually been writing for the In the Homestead Kitchen magazine for us. And uh, so you'll start seeing her articles come out very soon in the magazine if you are a subscriber. So I'm really excited to have her on today. She and her family live on a 10-acre homestead in rural Tennessee where she raises way too many chickens. Amen. Thank you very much. <laughs> we know she's a kindred spirit, right? Keeps bees, gardens, and homeschools her two boys. She also loves canning and preserving the food and fruits that they grow each year. Heather, welcome. You sound like exactly like our type of people. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's always good to talk to people who know what it's like to really get your hands dirty in the soil and to, you know, love our chickens and to enjoy um, just the fruits of our labor in a very real way of having them on our table. So thank you for coming on today. Yeah, this is exciting. Thanks. So what got you into Homestead? Before, before we dive into the main topic, which most of our listeners will know, we do a lot of chit chat at the beginning because what is a pantry chat without the chit chat? So at the very beginning, what got you into homesteading? Well, I had, I had dreamed of having a homestead for years and years, and we um, just couldn't make it happen until we moved to Tennessee and, you know, could really afford like a larger piece of property. And as soon as we moved out here, like I had always dreamed of having chickens. And so that was really like the very first thing I did. I planted a bunch of herbs because <laughs> there was nothing planted here. And I bought a bunch of chickens. And, you know, like I know there's a lot of people that get into chickens and they do their research and they know exactly how to set up the brooder and what to feed them. And I am, I'm amazed when people do that. I was not like that at all. <laughs> I was like, I want chickens and I want them right now. And I went, you know, I just went to the local co-op and got a bunch of chickens and I'm like, I'll just learn on the go. <laughs> and so I got these chickens and I just, I fell in love with them immediately. Like I just loved having chickens, but as they grew older, they started getting sick. And I didn't, I was like constantly on Google trying to figure out what was going on with my flock. And, you know, I lost birds to illnesses and predator attacks, and I wasn't really sure what I could be doing to prevent all this. And then I kind of stumbled on some articles from Lisa Steele about using herbs. And it's kind of funny that I didn't think about it at the time, but I'm a family herbalist and I use herbs all the time with my family. It just never occurred to me that I could do this with my chickens too. So once I started, you know, I just started experimenting with pretty much giving my chickens the same thing I was giving my children. Um, and it worked like as I got, you know, as the years went by and I experimented more with using uh, herbs with my chickens, there was far fewer instances of illness and disease and they were just healthier and more vibrant. Um, so yeah, it's really been a learning process, like figuring out what is going to work. And I'm always experimenting with herbs with my flock because there's there's really not a lot out there in terms of, you know, in terms of medical research and books written specifically for using herbs with chickens. Um, but as you know, like from talking to uh, Doc Jones, like he's been a huge inspiration in what I do with my own flock as well. So you can definitely use all these herbs with your chickens and, you know, there, there doesn't have to be any like special blends or they, they really cross over really well. You know, you're really touching on something that I think is such an important thing to bring out in the homestead journey for people. We go into homesteading with these like 
walls, like these lanes of understanding, right? Like here are my children and here are my chickens and here's mm-hmm. how I handle this and here's how I handle that. We're gonna and, cross. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't, don't cross, you know, it might get messy. And we really need these moments of like, okay, we've got to break down those walls a little bit. And sometimes mm-hmm. it makes us feel like, whoa, mind blown, right? Mm-hmm. Like I can just use the herbs that I'm using for my children on my chickens it, it opens up a whole world to us, mm-hmm. really. Because there's a yeah. lot of people who actually know a bit about herbs. They just don't know that they can apply what they know about herbs to other things besides humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it it is really amazing what what these herbs can do in terms of preventing illness. Um, like I said, when I first got chickens, you know, I sometimes I still like can't can't imagine what they got sick with when, you know, because when we moved here, there was, you know, they had had other chickens before. And this was like a working farm, so I know for sure uh, we went through fowl pox with that first flock. Um, definitely, like we we had some Merrick's disease with the second flock and. But since I started using all these different herbs that my chickens almost never get sick now. I mean, it's very rare that we'll have uh, an illness. So using these herbs in a preventive capacity can work really well. And I'm just super excited to be here today to talk about this because I don't don't feel like it really gets enough attention, uh, especially like using herbs with animals um, like chickens and, and, you know, other livestock that you might have on your farm. Yeah, I think this is great. It's a great topic to be talking about. How many chickens do you currently have? I have 30 and that's about to change next month. <laughs> I have an order coming from Hoover Hatcheries. It's going to be it's going to be a lot more than 30 after next month. <laughs> yeah, it's that kind of time of year, isn't it? Do you have just chickens or do you have any other poultry right now or will you when you get your orders in? No, yeah, I just have chickens right now. I I thought about getting guinea and I keep kind of I keep backing away from it. Um but yeah, it's just chickens right now. Yeah, well, sometimes guineas are hard on marriages. Let me just tell you. <laughs> I love my guineas, but you know, uh, every so many years I have to give up the guineas and go, Mm -hmm. okay, we can butcher off the guineas because (laughs) they're very, very loud. And I'm not always the one who's doing projects in the barn and getting followed all day long by Mm -hmm. a gaggle of guineas. (laughs) So yeah, definitely. Um, And then do you hatch out any of your chicks yourself or do you have your hens hatching out any? Yeah, I have have hens that hatch out um, and I'll either, uh, most of the time if they're roosters, I'll give those to neighbors or sell them off. Um, Because it, especially last year, I, I think every every chick that hatched out here, save one, was a rooster. (laughs) So we had so many roosters. So I told myself this year, I'm not letting anybody hatch out. And I know my will is going to crumble because as soon as they start setting on those eggs and I'm like, oh, we're going to have baby chicks. And I just, uh, I I can't not let them hatch out eggs because it's so cute to watch the mama hens with their babies and so I know, I know I'm going to crumble with that. There, there's other values to chickens aside from food value, mm-hmm. you know, between eggs and meat. And I think entertainment value um, and companionship actually are up there pretty high. As oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Great. So, okay. I want to dive right in because I think we have quite a bit to cover today. And um, let's talk right off about the common chicken diseases, what they are. And why are they so common? Well, you know, chickens get sick with different bacteria and viruses, just like we do. And they're always circulating. They can be in the soil. They can be carried in from wild birds. So, you know, there's there's really a lot that chickens can get sick with. And because they're a prey animal, chickens can be really, really sick, like have one foot in the grave before we even know that there's something wrong. And so that's why herbs can be such a great, um, work so well as a preventative is, you you know, you can really like stop those illnesses in their track if you have them on, you know, kind of a regimen of preventive herbs. Um, So if we're going to talk about, you know, all the different things that chickens can get sick with, we could start with something like parasites, which is really Mm -hmm. common, um, like in the spring and summer, and it can especially, they can especially be prevalent when it's wet outside. So 
you know, different bugs like lice and fleas and ticks and red mites and scaly like mites, chickens are all susceptible susceptible to those. And especially here in Tennessee, the ticks are so bad. I mean, it is just like a constant battle to to get rid of those ticks. Um, so if you're going to do a health check with your chickens just to see if they have any of these parasites, you're going to look for things like um, like them having like a dirty vent. So it's going to look like there's almost dirt, actually like pieces of dirt around their vent along the feather shafts. They might be listless or um, you might notice a drop in their egg production and they'll have like maybe some bald spots where they're constantly pecking or um, they might have some like red and scabbed skin. Mm. So those are all things that you want to look for to see if you have like a parasite problem. Okay. Would they be itching also if it was yeah, a topical just, thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And you'll, yeah, you'll see them with their, you know, they'll just be scratching away, you know, with their feet. So if you, if you do think that you have a parasite problem, um, one natural product that I really love to use is VetRx. And that is really great, especially for scaly leg mites. Um, those are mites that actually get up underneath the scales of the chicken's feet and will actually cause them to like raise up. And it can be very painful and cause an infection. So VetRx is, is great for that. Um, you can also use clove oil or cedarwood oil. Both of those essential oils are great um, because they dissolve the exoskeleton of, you know, like the ticks and the fleas. So just making a spray with those. And um, I did make like a uh, like a PDF download of, uh, of like a herbal bug spray. So hopefully we can put that in the in the show notes because that uh, that herbal herbs, the herbal spray that I use works really well. So you can actually mix all these essential oils together and spray it right on your chickens. And you can actually watch, you know, it's, it's almost like the bugs will start to dissolve. Oh. And that's mainly from like the clove and the cedar wood oil. Cause it just kind of, it just makes them dissolve. <laughs> it's oh, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. We'll put that in the blog post attached to this podcast. So you guys check out the link below for the blog post, and then you'll be able to grab that from there. So thank you so much for that, Heather. I'm, oh, I'm excited yeah. to give it a try and to mm -hmm. see it. Do you ever use anything like dust baths, like diatomaceous earth dust baths? Or... I do. Yeah. And that's a, yeah, it's definitely important for chickens to have an area where they can take a dust bath because that's so important uh, for helping them get rid of those, the lice and mites that they're prone to get. But you can put DE in the dust bath. And that's another product that works just like the clove and the cedar wood to really help dissolve, you know, the exoskeleton of those parasites. Mm, that's good. Just make sure you're always using food grade and not the mm -hmm. pool diatomaceous earth. Yes. Chemicals <laughs> in there. But the food grade is a very natural product and it can be great for, for health in those different mm -hmm. ways. So that's great. Um, good. So those are parasitic. Now, most of what we just talked about are for like topical parasites. Mm -hmm. Do you do anything different for maybe an internal parasite? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of different herbs that you can use for internal parasites. And one of my favorite is, is just plain garlic, just giving your chickens fresh garlic. Um, and, you know, as we go through all these different illnesses, garlic is one I'm going to bring up again and again, because it's so, it's, it's anti-everything. It's antibacterial, antiviral, anti-parasitic, anti-fungal, anti-inflammatory. Really, like I tell my members in Chicken Health Academy, if you only have time to do one thing for your chickens, give them fresh garlic in their water. Really, that's, you know, to me, that is just the panacea of, you know, just the, if you're going to do one thing, garlic is going to solve so many of your problems. And you definitely want to try to use fresh garlic. Um, when garlic is dried, uh, a lot of the compounds are lost in that drying process. So just chopping up like two cloves of garlic and putting it right in their water and just swapping those out every couple of days is really such an easy way to give your chickens the benefits of, uh, you know, the benefits that are in garlic. So really just that easy, like just chop it up. You're not having to heat it. You're not having to do anything. Mm -hmm. You just drop it right into their drinking water and let it yep. kind of infuse slowly in yep. the drinking water. Yep. And you I, know, I, that's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. And if you are at a point where maybe you're working a lot or have a lot of farm chores, you can even buy the jarred, you know, like you can buy it in the supermarket, the jarred garlic that's fresh and just keep that in the fridge. So if, you don't even have to chop it up, but definitely try to use fresh over dry uh, because it's just so much better for your chickens. Oh, great. 
So you can also, you, I really like using oregano essential oil. It's a great anti-parasitic. Um, I don't usually recommend people use essential oils a lot because they're so potent and it's so easy to overdose when you're using an essential oil. But oregano oil is, is definitely one that I always recommend people use um, because it, it's just such a great antiparasitic. It's antiviral, it's antibacterial, and it, it is very potent though. So you definitely just want to do maybe like one drop per gallon for your chickens um, and just leave it at that. Like just give it a good stir because if you just drop it on the water, it's going to sit right on the top. So you do need to mix it in as much as you can. Um, but oregano oil is one that but like when, if we're traveling, like we don't ever travel without oregano oil because it's such a great remedy for food poisoning too. And I know chickens don't really get food poisoning, but we do. <laughs> so I always take it with us whenever we go anywhere. So as a family herbalist, it's so wonderful when you're like, I can have one set of, you know, remedies and I can apply it all the way across the board. I can apply mm -hmm. it to, you know, the different animals. I can apply it to the people in my family. That just simplifies things so much instead of having the vet box, you mm -hmm. know, where it's like, this yeah. is the chicken vet box and the mm -hmm. cow vet, vet box. You're like, no, nah, I just have my herbal, you know, my herbal remedies ready to go for everybody. That, mm -hmm. that actually really simplifies things a lot. <laughs> it, it does. I mean, I do have like a chicken first aid kit, but when it comes to giving my chickens herb, I have a huge cabinet in our kitchen where I keep all my herbal stuff and it's all in one spot. So it, anything I would give my family, I'm also giving to the chickens and the dogs and the cats. And yeah, there's, there's no separation, which is, which is really great. I think if there's only one takeaway for somebody to take out of this talk today, hopefully there'll be a lot. I've already learned myself. I'm going to get out there with uh, garlic myself and get it into the chicken water. But if there's only one, I think the important one is that you don't need special things. If you just have high quality herbs that you can use to treat your family, you can apply them in other places. And it's mm -hmm. not just even the chickens. That mm -hmm. goes a lot further than that to the other livestock. So great. Okay. So parasit parasites were the first one. What else might we deal with when it comes to chickens? Well, I, I just want to touch quickly mm -hmm. on um, coccidiosis because I know so many people worry it. That's another parasitic uh, disease that chickens are very prone to. Um, but everything that I just talked about, you can also use for coccidiosis. Um, but you can also like, there are herbs like chamomile, and sage, which are also great antimicrobials. And you can give those even to your baby chicks. Um, you generally won't see coccidiosis before three weeks because, you know, it takes time for those, uh, for that parasite to reach dangerous levels in the brooder. But you can give your baby chicks fresh garlic. You can put chamomile and sage tea uh, right in their water. Like you can give your baby chicks pretty much anything you're going to give your adult hens as long as they have, you know, chick grit, uh, you know, if you're putting this in food. But yeah, I just urge people to always like, especially when you're having chicks shipped in, um, their immune systems are stressed from shipping. So giving them, you know, fresh garlic, uh, a wonderful tea like chamomile or sage right off the bat, maybe with some nutri drench put right in the water can definitely help get them off to a, a healthy start and maybe help prevent, you know, illnesses like coccidiosis. Great. Good. All right. Moving on from parasites, what, what else might we face? All right. Well, we can talk about bacteria. <laughs> there are so many different things that can infect our poor chickens when it comes to bacterial diseases. And a lot of them cause respiratory illnesses like chronic respiratory disease. Um, coryza like causes respiratory uh, symptoms. So chickens especially have very sensitive respiratory systems. So they're very prone to getting these different bacterial diseases, like especially in their lungs. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, again, I already mentioned garlic, but garlic is really fantastic for helping prevent some of these respiratory illnesses. And it, it works um, by, it helps to strengthen the cellular walls so that uh, bacteria and viruses can't get in to replicate. 
Now, other herbs like elderberry um, and Chinese skullcap, they work the same way by strengthening cellular walls. So that's why it's such a great preventative. So if you can keep your chickens on something like garlic all the time, it's really going to help prevent a lot of these illnesses because they're, they won't be able to replicate as easily. So uh, in addition to you know, just giving garlic every day, um, especially for respiratory infections. Like I will use essential oils, like in an, uh, like a diffuser. Mm -hmm. So oils like uh, eucalyptus are great because if a chicken or, a, you know, I do it with my children too. If they're breathing in these essential oils, some of them, especially like eucalyptus, can actually help kill the bacteria that are present in the lungs. So when I have a chick, chicken that's suffering maybe from sneezing or coughing or maybe coming down with something, I'll put her in a sick bay and put her, you know, we have kind of a small laundry room. So I put the sick bay in the laundry room and shut all the doors and just put my diffuser in there with some eucalyptus and maybe rosemary and hyssop. All of those are great uh, for respiratory illnesses. And I'll leave her in there for a day or two, just breathing in those essential oils. And it is amazing how effective that can be for just like calming those symptoms and helping her get over that. So I definitely wouldn't give these um, essential oils internally, but breathing in, you know, oils like that can really help with uh, a respiratory infection because they're uh, antimicrobial. So that can be a great way to, you know, easily help your chickens kind of get over the hump and, and start getting better. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That is very interesting. How often do you find that you need to separate out an ill chicken? Like, is that kind of protocol for you? First thing you do if you, you yeah. find that it's not doing well? Yeah, if if anybody's in, in my flock is, you know, starts to go downhill, if they're showing any symptoms, I always pull her out of the flock. And, you know, I've got like a dog crate that I use with, you know, that's big enough for her to be in there comfortably with food and water. And I keep bedding in there. And I'll, Usually I'll put her inside the house just so I can keep an eye on her. But yeah, you definitely want to isolate chickens um, if you notice that they're they're not acting normally. You know, I, I think, again, we're just seeing how what we know about family health, we can apply in other places. Like that's what you do with a child, right? Somebody's mm -hmm. not feeling well, let's put them to bed in their bedroom, keep an eye on them, mm -hmm. make sure they're resting and they're not stressed in some way from the other chickens. You know, chickens have a tendency as soon as one of them gets stressed, the other ones can start going on the attack and get mm -hmm. really yeah. towards that hen. And that does not help anybody's uh, healing if they're mm -hmm. getting attacked constantly. So mm -hmm. getting them into a place where they're safe, they're comfortable, they're secure, and they don't have to face maybe quite as much input. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's it. That's kind of standard medical practice. So it's mm -hmm. great to just see how it's applied. So yeah, I also want to talk, um, you know, going back to the respiratory, um, because, you know, like I said, chickens, can really be prone to these respiratory diseases. So um, if you have chamomile tea that is uh, very healing and soothing for the respiratory tract, there's also a plant that grows prolifically around here. I don't know if it grows everywhere, but it's called mullion. Uh, do you do you have that where you are? We, we have a lot of mullion where okay. we are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's another great herb that really grows, you know, along roadsides. I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to find. Um, and that that is a great herb to dry and drink as a tea because it really helps open up the airways. And I've given my chickens mullion before, um, you know, if I notice that they're sneezing or coughing, like any type of respiratory illness, I always turn to, you know, chamomile and mullion to, to help just, you know, open up their respiratory tract and help them clear out that congestion. Mm. Yeah, that's a great herb. Good one. I definitely mm -hmm. use that in the household with people, but I have never considered giving that to chicken. <laughs> so that's great. I, I love it. Good. What are some of the other things we might face? We've got kind of a long list of them, don't we? I know. There's all these different <laughs> uh, categories of things that you might run into when you're dealing mm -hmm. with a chicken illness, just like humans. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's another one? So we can uh, talk about, uh, definitely I would like to talk about Biden's Pelosa. Um, because that 
that's kind of an herb that I have looked for on our property for years. It's it's also called Spanish needles or beggar ticks. Mm. And I could never find it. You know, and we, our property is such that we've got pasture and we have a creek and a spring as well as forest. So we actually have like quite a lot of diversity growing on, you know, just naturally on our property. And so Biden's is a plant that grows just everywhere in the Southeast and the Southwest. And I've seen it range like as far up into Canada. So it might be growing, you know, where you are as well. Mm. And it, it is a wonderful um, antibacterial and antiviral. And it's especially uh, indicated for staph infections. So I looked for it everywhere and never could find it here. And so I was like, well, I, I was talking to my members at Chicken Health Academy. We were all talking about what we we're going to plant this year. I'm like, well, I'm just going to plant Biden's because it's not growing here. And you know, I just really need it because especially for the bumblefoot, because it's been going around with everybody. Um, and Biden's is a plant that you definitely want to use fresh. So the drying, uh, you lose a lot of the beneficial com compounds with Biden's when it's dried. So I was just about to order seeds when I happened to see a picture of, it was like a different picture of Biden's. And I saw the seed pods and I'm like, wait a second, this is I know what this is. It's growing all over my property. And I never knew it was Biden's because I was always looking for the flower. Mm. You know, it has like a little white flower with uh, a yellow center. And the Biden's that grows on my property doesn't flower. So I was always, you know, it was right in front of me this whole time. And I just never, you know, I just never knew because I was looking for one thing. So I wanted, I just kind of wanted to bring this up because like, especially as people start foraging for some of these herbs, it really helps to see as many different pictures of a plant as possible because you can look at one picture of a plant and it may look really different, you know, in the picture you're looking at compared to how it's outgrowing in the wild. So, you know, as you're foraging for maybe like and tain or nettle, like some of these other herbs that I wanted to talk about later. But yeah, just like try to look at many different pictures because, it, you know, it might be that you're looking at the plant the whole time, but, you know, if you, you just might not even know. <laughs> That's what now, it is. That completely happened to me back many, many years ago, right at the very beginning of my foraging career. And I was actually just a teenager in Southern California, and I had all these books, and I could not find plantain for anything. Well, mm -hmm. come to find out later when I moved to Tennessee, uh, and I instantly identified plantain. The reason was is because in Southern California, it's so dry that my plantain was literally, you know, an inch tall, the leaves mm -hmm. were. And here I'm seeing all these pictures of these leaves that are like... <laughs> a foot tall and like these huge leaves. And I just couldn't identify it one to the other. Now, of course, you know, once you start experiencing that plant and you identify it, you can see all of its variations and you start mm -hmm. to really get to know it. But yeah, it's a really good thought. Get a lot of photos. And if you can find somebody who already knows what the plant is, oh yeah, let them just point it out to you. It just is going to save you so much headache. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, plantain is such a wonderful, that was another one I was going to bring up later, but while we're talking about it, um, plantain is great to use for bumblefoot because it's such a great drawing agent. And so you can put the poultice, like I just usually make a spit poultice when I need to draw an infection, um, but you can just make a spit poultice or if you want to make a tincture with plantain, you could put that right on the staph infection. And the thing with bumblefoot is it can really take a while. I mean, it's it's a lot of work to pull that infection out. I know some of my members in Chicken Health Academy have been battling bumblefoot for weeks, like cleaning with the Epsom salt multiple times a day and just trying to pull that infection out. Um, and that's why I was so excited to try to find Biden's Pelosa because I really, I really think that that could be an effective remedy for staff and maybe speed up that whole healing process. Um, but yeah, Plantain is one of those herbs that just grows just about everywhere. I mean, I bet probably anybody watching or listening on the podcast could go out in their yard or down the sidewalk and find find plantain when it's growing because it's just it's really it loves anywhere humans have gone. You can find plantain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's one of it's a very ubiquitous like 
it's one of those herbs that is ranks at the top of herbs that I think people should know about just because you can find it wherever you go. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're away from home or you move or whatever happens, you're going to find plantain kind of like dandelions, like dandelions, pine, you know, uh, uh, plantain. They're, they're all over the place just waiting for us to need them, which I just mm -hmm. love. <laughs> Good. All right. What else might we deal with when it comes to chickens? Well, we also need to touch on viral infections because those are, that's another really broad area um, that of, of different illnesses that our chickens are at great risk from. Um, one of those is Newcastle disease, which is super highly contagious. Um, it causes a lot of respiratory symptoms. And Newcastle disease is often confused with avian influenza. So they have very similar symptoms of, you know, just respiratory distress and sneezing and coughing. Um, so it, it's really, it can be really hard to tell the difference between those two. And in terms of treatment um, between that and maybe something else like infectious bronchitis, it, we're going to be using pretty much the same herbs to treat all of these different viral infections. Um, Merrick's disease is another really important uh, viral and you know viral disease that it, if you have chickens you're eventually going to have to deal with Merrick's disease. Um, the thing about Merrick's is a, you know there's a lot of fear when it comes to Merrick's disease and you know the same as with the avian influenza um, and as we've seen with avian influenza it can cause just massive destruction you know when it sweeps through flocks and we've had to you know there have been huge poultry farms that have had to call their you know their entire block over, you know, diseases like avian influenza. But this is where these preventative herbs can come in so handy um, just by strengthening our bird's immune system to avoid some of these really like pathogenic viruses that are spreading. Um, now, when it comes to Merrick's, Merrick's disease, there, you know, there's not really any type of vaccination for these other respiratory diseases like the avian influenza. But Merrick's disease is something that you can vaccinate your, your chicks from. Uh, but the chicks do have to be vaccinated like the, the day they hatch. And it's pretty much something that has to be done at the hatchery. So, I mean, I mean, I know everyone's going to have a different opinion on vaccination. Um, when it comes to Merrick, the Merrick's disease vaccine, I'm very pro vaccine uh, because it's not a foolproof vac vaccine, but I've had Merrick's disease sweep through my flock. And with, you know, a lot of members in Chicken Health Academy have also been dealing with Merrick's and it can, it can be a really devastating disease. It causes paralysis. I mean, there's, there's five different forms of Merrick's, but the, the most common is uh, the nerve form where, you know, the chicken will, kind of lose its ability to walk and maybe have like one leg flopped forward and you know her poor head is she just can't hold her head up um but thankfully there there are some herbs that we can use to it you know maybe not wholly prevent Merrick's disease but lessen the severity of some of these symptoms um I'm gonna say it again <laughs> garlic <laughs> I love garlic so much. Like if you only do one thing, please give your chickens garlic because it's so good. But oregano oil, um, this is one that I have direct experience with. I don't have any scientific, scientific proof that oregano oil works to protect the rest of your flock. But I used it when, because um, some of my silkies came down with Merrick's a few years ago. Um, it also swept through my neighbor's flock. And once we started seeing the symptoms and we were like, oh my God, this is Merrick's. I got everybody on oregano oil. We got everybody on um, another herb, Chinese skull cap, because that is a broad spectrum antiviral. Um, and it works kind of like garlic does by inhibiting the viral replication. So we got all of our flocks on these you know, three things. We had garlic, oregano oil, and Chinese skull cap. And we really noticed a reduction in the rate of spread. Um, we did have a few more chickens fall ill with the disease, but it wasn't like a devastating, you know, massive outbreak. Mm -hmm. So I would urge anybody who's maybe, if maybe they suspect that Merrick's is starting to go through their flock, focus on those three, garlic, oregano oil, and Chinese skull cap. Um, there is a different, there is an American skull cap and that's more of a nervine. So people don't need to, that won't do anything for marriage. You definitely want the Chinese skull cap for that. Right. Wonderful. I mean, 
I feel like we're seeing a pattern emerging here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like if you have chickens that you want to keep healthy or they get sick, there's kind of a protocol that we're looking at of, you know, keep, and keep them healthy with some garlic. If you mm -hmm. start seeing some symptoms of something, maybe it's time to add some oregano oil and maybe some of the Chinese skullcap right there just to kind of head off before, you know, because sometimes it takes a while to go out. You go out, you see ill chickens and then you're like, trying to research what is this what are the symptoms maybe you're not seeing the full range of of symptoms yet especially if you're especially in tune to your flock and you're watching every day to make sure everybody looks healthy you may catch mm -hmm. early symptoms and not be seeing it all so you know there are steps that you can take regardless of what the disease actually ends up being mm -hmm. right at the very beginning get that mm -hmm. garlic in there get that oregano oil in there and consider pretty quickly adding some chinese skull cap mm -hmm. and how would you give or administer the Chinese skull cap. So especially with when you're using like a tincture with chickens, when you're thinking about an adult dose, that's usually like a teaspoon or like one, you know, I kind of just eyeball it at one dropper full. So that's like an adult dose is one dropper. So when you think about a chicken, which is maybe like five or six or seven pounds, you really have to like, you know, when you're thinking about dosing, it's really just going to be a few drops. And the easiest way I've found to to give a chicken a tincture is to put it in a little bit of water and just use an oral syringe and just kind of dribble it, you know, on the left side of their throat, making sure it goes down their throat um, and just do that several times a day. Would you do that over putting it in the water for the whole coop? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a, you can definitely, you know, if you're, if you're doing like a widespread yeah. Uh, application for your whole flock, I would definitely recommend putting it right in their water. Um, I guess I was thinking like when, when I'm giving a chicken a tincture for like an acute case, like something very specific, this chicken needs treatment right now. That's how I'm going to give it to her just a few drops in a little bit of water and just dribble it down her throat with a syringe. Okay. That's the laundry room protocol, right? Mm -hmm. When they get <laughs> when they get isolated, <laughs> taken into the ER, they get it right into the mouth with the syringe. That's great. Mm -hmm. So then the same protocol would kind of apply for something like uh, the avian influenza that, you know, we've heard a lot about over the last few years. It's, mm -hmm. it's a scare. You've kind of already talked about it a little bit here, but you know, that's been a big scare for a lot of people. And there's even been states that have started kind of, there's been rumblings about destroying um, private flocks. Mm -hmm. of chickens just to yeah. try to stop the avian influenza from spreading. I know we're in Idaho. There's a lot of chicken producers apparently in Idaho. And so there was a lot of rumblings about like, what's going to happen if this hits here really badly. Mm -hmm. So would you use the same protocol uh, for the, um, for the avian influenza? If you, if you think that might be what you're facing in your flock? Yeah, I definitely would. Um, especially with an herb like Chinese skullcap, because it is a broad spectrum antiviral, I would get my whole flock on the Chinese skullcap, the garlic, the oregano oil. Um, I would also probably throw some isatis in there. Um, mm -hmm. Isatis is an herb that is in like the cabbage family, and it, it's not very common in this country. Um, I have to get it the root dried uh, from a specialized herbal dealer. But every time we have ever come down with any type of flu or any type of viral infection, we always turn to Isatis. And it, it tastes awful of like, <laughs> of, of all the herbal tinctures that we take, and we take a bunch, I would say Isatis is definitely the most foul tasting one of them all. It, it really tastes like licking someone's sweaty feet. It's, it's awful, but it's very effective. And so I would definitely recommend getting your flock uh, on Isatis. And these are all herbs that you could put right in their water. Um, you know, since you're not treating like an acute condition, if we're just using this as maybe a preventative measure, you just start mixing it in uh, with their water. And you might want to throw, be, uh, because especially Isatis is so foul tasting. Um, I would also recommend throwing some herbs in there that are going to mask that taste so your chickens will actually drink the water. So maybe throwing some apple cider vinegar in there or some fresh mint. Um, you know, just to just to mask the taste of some of those really strong tasting herbs so that your chickens continue to drink and continue to get those good herbs in their in their system. That is definitely an herb we have in our flu preventative uh, tinctures in our house, too. And it's it's one that is actually an amazing herb. If you're not familiar with it, it's worth getting to know it. But yeah, I agree. That flavor is 
<laughs> it's something else. You think you're pretty like solid about taking things that don't taste good. Ooh, that is going to push everybody's boundaries. I know. It's, a, it's a very special treat <laughs> when you have to take Isatis. Exactly. I have to make sure to have something like a good spoonful of honey to follow it up for the kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to get something to get that flavor out of your mouth. So, so far we've really talked about some of the more infectious diseases, things like the bacteria, the parasites, viruses, is, but there are other things that can really affect the flock health too. Some of them are very, um, you know, like nutritional, right? Mm -hmm. uh, underfeeding your chickens. That's going to make yeah. them, it's going to make them not healthy. Um, so let's talk about that for just a minute and things that we can do to help make sure we have really well nourished and well-fed chickens. Because we know from human health, there is a difference between well-fed and well-nourished, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Very well fed and be incredibly undernourished at the exact same time, which is a lot of why we see so much obesity mm -hmm. in our uh, culture at the time is people just keep eating and eating because their body is saying, you need more nourishment. And so they keep popping potato chips or whatever it is into their mouth and they're not getting the nourishment that they need, but they're getting more calories than mm -hmm. they do, need, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely having a foundation of good nutrition for your chickens is so important. Um, Cause like you just said, our own health depends on having like a, a really healthy diet so that our bodies have the vitamins and minerals and amino acids they need to fight off these different diseases. So making sure that your chickens are getting everything they need uh, either by giving them layer feed, limiting their treats, trying to give them access to fresh bugs and fresh greens, um, which can be challenging in the winter time when none of that is growing. But if you can do things like maybe starting to sprout grains uh, and seeds for your chickens, that's a wonderful way to get them fresh greens every day. Um, and I also love fermenting feed for my chickens. And fermentation is such it, it's such an easy thing to do. And I know a lot of people feel really overwhelmed when they think about fermenting anything, but especially, you know, grains for their chickens. But fermentation really opens up a lot of the vitamins and minerals and other nutrients in something like if you do layer feed or mix in grains like quinoa or corn or barley, um, it really opens up the amount of available nutrients in whatever you're fermenting so that your chickens are getting more nutrients, but they're actually eating less. So if you start fermenting on a regular basis, it can actually help cut your feed costs because your chickens are still getting all these great nutrients, but they're getting, you know, maybe 20, they're eating maybe around 20% less feed because their bodies are getting what they need. Um, so yeah, fermenting, I, I just always recommend people do that. And it really is as simple as just putting grains in a jar, covering it with water and letting it sit, stirring it every day for, for three days, like in a warm room out of light. And just like when you're making sourdough or making sauerkraut, it's going to smell tangy and fresh. And, you know, it's it, a good for healthy ferment is not going to smell bad. So I always have <laughs> in my kitchen various jars and, you know, different stages of ferment. And it's, it does not stink up your kitchen or anything. Um, but yeah, and my chickens love it. Like when I go out and they figure out that I'm carrying their fermented feed, it is like a mad rush, you know, because the just the flavor, it improves the flavor and they want to eat more. So there's never, there's never any leftovers when I you know, take out fermented feed for them. But that's a great way to um, boost their immune system because the the fermented uh, grains is going to give them so many healthy pr uh, probiotics. And that is a great immune booster. So when you think about helping your chickens overcome, you know, a lot of these viruses and bacteria and preventing them getting sick in the first place, um, giving them fermented feed is is a great part of, you know, just setting them up with, with a great foundational nutrition. We uh, scale up around our house right now. We have over a hundred chickens. Oh and my goodness. We wow. Started. We'll do, we'll do about 600, I think this year, uh, uh, broilers that we'll mm -hmm. raise. So we can have a lot of chickens on the place in addition to a lot of other poultry at any given time. So our fermenting program looks more like a long line of five gallon buckets. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> goodness. That's amazing. 
time of year. It's so cold. It's freezing outside and those buckets will freeze and mm -hmm. uh, here they'll freeze solid. And so of course that stops fermentation right there mm -hmm. as soon as something's frozen. So we have a long line of chicken buckets in the, uh, in the kitchen area where we have a wood burning cook stove that runs a lot of the time. And so it keeps it kind of warm and keeps them going and fermenting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just a great way to go, whether you're human, you're a chicken. Uh, in addition to all the health benefits that you just listed for the chickens, it also pre-digests the food, which means that the animal's body is able to spend its energy doing something else rather than all the work of digesting, mm -hmm. um, which means you've got more energy for maybe egg laying, for staying warm in the winter and having better body condition, for the immune system to have to really fire up and be active. It really helps give the animal a lot of available you know, energy that's still mm -hmm. left in their body. And so it's just a great thing to do all the way around. Mm -hmm. I also wanted, wanted to mention too, like when, as we're talking about different, you know, healthy things you can give your chickens, um, cause we brew our own kombucha here. So I'm always giving our chickens some of the kombucha that we're brewing when we have extra SCOBY, I put that out for them. SCOBY is the, you know, <laughs> the, the, it's like a, fleshy type of, you know, bacteria and yeast, I, you know, it, it actually looks like kind of a diseased organ, but that is the SCOBY is what is, you know, making this ferment, but chickens love it. I mean, it is, it's so good for them. And when I put out extra SCOBY for them, they just, they gobble it up. Um, and the SCOBY is also great. Like I've put it directly on wounds. Um, it's great to, you know, as a, to accelerate healing and wounds. So if you do brew kombucha, you can give that to your chickens. I usually will put out like a quarter to a half a cup in their water, just mix it right in when we, uh, when we have extra and they really like the taste of it. Yeah. That's, so a, that's, that's a really good thought. So are there any, let's see, are there any other herbs that you would give preventatively or is it mostly the, uh, the, the three that we've talked about here is kind of the top ones you've talked about the garlic, obviously the oregano, and then the Chinese skull cap is kind of another one. Do you tend to give the Chinese skull cap preventatively or just when there's like a flu or something in the area? Yeah, I, with the Chinese skull cap, I generally use that when there's a specific issue that I have to deal with. Um, if we're talking about just general herbs that you give your chickens every day, um, I would definitely recommend uh, the garlic, as I mentioned, oregano. Um, Turmeric is another one that I give my chickens on a regular basis. Because uh, it's a great anti-inflammatory, it's a great immune booster. Um, research has shown that it's effective against candida. So if you're dealing with an issue like sauerkraut or vent gleet, um, giving your chickens turmeric internally and then also externally, uh, you know, when you're dealing with the with the vent gleet can uh, really help them overcome an illness like that. And especially sauerkraut and vent gleet, um, that's another illness that has I've seen that's been going around a lot with Chicken Health Academy members over the past like six months. Um, so yeah, turmeric, I will mix in with their feed. Um, the problem with doing like a dried spice like that is it can sift down to the bottom so that yeah. your chickens like aren't getting as much. But if you, like whenever I put out fermented feed, I always put mix in turmeric right into that. Um, and that's another thing, like if you are making your chickens anything, like if you have you know, extra eggs or, you know, if you're giving your chickens like oatmeal or fermented feed, throw as much as that good stuff into that as you can, like the fresh garlic, um, different herbs and spices like cayenne is another good one that I put uh, in their fermented feed. Once it's done fermenting is when I'll add, you know, some of these herbs and spices in because um, cayenne is, is great for uh, reducing inflammation and kind of boosting the immune system and just especially in the winter time helping their blood you know just get moving and help to keep them warmer um, but any fresh herbs that you have like in your kitchen just feel free to like just start experimenting and put those in whatever you're putting out for your chickens because they they just love it and they're going to get all the benefits um, of you know what you're putting out yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, really quickly, before we have to wrap up, I would love it if you would take us through your process when you walk out to the coop and you identify that you have a hen that is not doing well. Mm -hmm. Like, What are the different steps that you take? Well, the first thing that I'm going to do is, you know, if she's 
generally like kind of in the coop huddled down like obviously not feeling well i'm going to pull her out of the coop and put her in sick bay and kind of just start going through a checklist of well what seems to be wrong like a lot of times i will jump to like is she egg bound because a lot of times if a chicken looks sick that can kind of be the first thing that i think might be wrong so i'll do a quick check to see if she's egg bound um, and that's just super easy to do. You'll just put a glove on your hand, lube it up with maybe some olive oil or coconut oil, and just gently insert your fingers into her vent and about two inches just to see if there's an egg stuck in there. Um, most of the time, thankfully, <laughs> it's not egg binding, but just because that is an issue that is so quickly fatal, I always mm -hmm. kind of check for that first. Um, but I'll start looking for any other symptoms like uh, is she sneezing? you know, has she been eating? Did she stop laying? So it's almost like you have to go down this rabbit hole of just checking off like what is amiss. Um, and then, you know, if it's something like generally, I'll be able to figure it out fairly quickly what's wrong with her. But if not, then it's like that's when you start turning to your library of books or get on the internet to start researching and figuring out what could possibly be wrong with that chicken. But yeah, pulling yeah, pulling her out of the flock and so you can really observe her more closely is always always the first step. Okay. And then do you do anything for the rest of the flock kind of like automatically? I know in my family when somebody starts not feeling well, we all start a different protocol of like mm -hmm. everybody else know there's something in the house. Yeah. We need to start taking extra precautions. Is that where you would do something else for the rest of the flock? Yeah. I mean, if you know, I already have my girls on garlic all the time. I do oregano um, in their feed, like dried oregano or fresh. So if I suspect that something is starting to go around, that's when I will get them on the oregano oil. I'll start mixing it into their water um, and get that, you know, inside everybody right away. Um, but yeah, like your family, you know, it's like when we're sick, it's like, oh, we're getting on fire cider, we're getting on elderberry. <laughs> so it's right. like, you're right, like you kind of do have to take like a different more like defensive position, like, okay, mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do. Um, but yeah, like, because everybody is already on garlic, we don't really see that much illness anymore, which is, you know, why I just tell everybody, like, if you can get your chickens on, you know, the garlic, it's, it's really going to prevent so many problems down the road. You know, I just think it's wonderful because garlic is easy to grow. Mm -hmm. It stores so easily. I mean, and then it's good for just about everything besides from being delicious to helping everything be healthy. I just think that that's not a mistake. <laughs> I think there's a lot of intelligent design there. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, it's a good clue to say, maybe we should start using garlic. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> And that's the thing, problem. like so many of these herbs that are so good for our chickens are so easy to grow. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it definitely makes treating them more cost effective when you're, you're growing them. So just making like a simple herb garden, like maybe just starting to grow your own garlic, definitely are, are herbs like oregano and thyme are great for your chickens. Um, I also grow a lot of stinging nettle uh, which is great to give your chickens during molt because it's so high in iron um, and they really love it dried or cooked. So yeah, like just, I would just urge people to start experimenting with, you know, what would I like to grow for my family and that I can also give to my chickens because once those herbs start coming back year after year, like you don't, you don't have to do anything. It's like, they're just doing their own thing and, you know, you can just go harvest whatever you need. So it makes it really easy. Yeah, I, I love that about herbs. And that was one of the reasons that I originally got into herbalism for my family is because the herbs are there whether I need them or not. Once mm -hmm. you get them planted and established, it's like your bigger deal is what do I do with all this oregano that's now spreading <laughs> poking over, which is a great, you know, great when you can say, so throw it, in, cut it off and throw it in the chicken coop. It's good mm -hmm. for them. They'll enjoy it and it helps all sorts of things. So I think it's a, it's just a win-win when you can be growing all of your own herbs or at least a big handful of them. And you can sprinkle them generously everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you get to be the herb fairy and you can put them in the coops and you can put them in the pins and you can put them all over the place. I really like that. Yeah. And some of these herbs, like if you can do like lavender and mint, 
um, and chamomile and calendula, you can put those right in the nesting boxes. And, you know, I know like when I first got chickens, I was like, oh, I would love to, you know, buy some nesting box herbs because they were so beautiful. And I started looking at the prices. I'm like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> so I started just planting all these myself. And, you know, now I mix my own blends, uh, you know, and I throw some yarrow in there and some, you know, just whatever is growing at the time. Um, and you don't have to buy these like 30 or $50 bags of nesting box herbs. You know, you can just make up your own blends and you know, it's, it's a lot more gratifying to me to do that, to be able to like grow these herbs for my chickens and give them all these benefits than having to buy, you know, from other retailers. Cause you know, a lot of times you don't know how long those herbs have been sitting there on the mm -hmm. shelf anyway, you know, so you definitely have more control in terms of like potency and, you know, just being able to just harvest it yourself and give it right to your chickens. You're going to get a better product when it's, when it's grown just right in your yard. Heather, thank you so much for all of this amazing information. Oh, Where so can people get a hold of you if they would like to learn more about all of the different things you teach? Yeah, so in uh, I have an online membership, Chicken Health Academy, where we focus heavily on using all these different herbs uh, for prevention. Um, I teach a lot of emergency care strategies because uh, what I notice with my chickens and with a lot of other people, it's like we get these chickens and we love them. And then if they have like a, you know, traumatic event, like a predator attack, a lot of people don't know how to deal with that. They don't know what to do and they panic. Um, so in Chicken Health Academy, I teach what do you do when trauma happens to your chickens? How do you go about diagnosing an illness? Um, so it's really just like a great, you know, just all around great course for learning how to care for your chicken's health and prevent a lot of the illness and diseases that we've been talking about. Yeah, I want to just break in here and say I've gotten to see inside the academy and I was learning so much right off the bat. It's oh, definitely yay. a place that I was like, because we've had a lot of a uh, hard time identifying the different illnesses when we've seen it. You know, we just have mm -hmm. one hen that doesn't do well. And we're like, hey, I think it was this, but I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a place where I was like, okay, now I know I can come get help in identifying these things. And I mm -hmm. have some resource for figuring this out. Mm -hmm. So if this is something, if you're keeping hens, you want to learn more about um, you know, treating them with natural herbs and other natural means, then it's definitely something to check out. We do live workshops uh, once a month. We have an incredible uh, Facebook community where you can go and get your questions answered by me and our moderator, Carla. Um, and members do that all the time, especially when you're having an emergency and you don't know what's going on with your flock. They'll go over to the Facebook group and say what's going on and share pictures. And, you know, together as a group, we're always helping diagnose what's going on. OK, well, thank you so much, Heather. This has been really informative. And I know I am going to plant more garlic this year and get ready to be able to use it for my chickens because it sounds like that's a great thing to do. Yep. <laughs> All thank right. You so thank much. you so <laughs> much. Goodbye. Goodbye.